The Forbidden Weapons One of the most fascinating hidden features within certain Monster Hunter games. Weapons that are hidden within the code that can be retrieved and used through special means. These weapons are usually much stronger than any other weapons in the game. They feature incredible stats and even their own unique names and descriptions, should you be fortunate enough to get your hands on them. Today we will be looking at one of the greatest Monster Hunter games ever made, and that is Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate on the 3DS, which not only boasts 14 different weapon types, but the developers snuck in two forbidden weapons for each kind, meaning we have 28 weapons to go over today, and they are among some of the most broken and fascinating I've seen to date. Previously, I went over the forbidden weapons within Monster Hunter Tri, which only had seven forbidden weapons in total, so we're in for a treat today, fellas. If you've ever played Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, you know that the developers put a lot of love and care into it, and it's no different when it comes to these secret weapons. Why put so much effort and detail into something 99% of the player base will never see? I have no idea. Nevertheless, this is not going to stop me from enlightening you guys with the 28 forbidden weapons of 4 Ultimate. This 3DS exclusive is a deep and expansive game, especially when it comes to its weapon system. Not only can you make hordes of weapons through its enormous roster of monsters, you can trade parts to make weapons and armor for monsters that weren't even in the game. On top of that, it even has a system where you can farm relic weapons with randomized stats and appearances that could usually surpass anything you could get by normal means, depending on the weapon type. Some of these forbidden weapons make those relic weapons look like your little brother's first weapon upgrade in low rank. They are no joke. MH4U had a bunch of different mechanics involving its weapon types, such as its unique Kinsect upgrading system, its weapon owning system, the Ceregios passives. So there's a lot of detail and nuance when it comes to the weapon mechanics of this game, and today I'll try my best to simplify and explain them as we go over these incredible weapons. I'm very excited to show them off today, and similar to my previous video on the topic, I'm going to be showing them off from what I believe to be the weakest of the forbidden weapons to the strongest. If Monster Hunter content is something you're interested in, consider subscribing to the Fly N2 channel. We're only seven people away from reaching eight subscribers. Please. One of the first questions you're probably asking is how do you obtain these so-called forbidden weapons? What makes them forbidden anyway? Are you just clickbaiting me? Surprisingly, no. These weapons I'll be showing you today simply can't be obtained by any normal means. They're hidden within the code of the game, so you have to get creative. I stumbled onto a piece of software called the APM MH4U Save Editor. Essentially, you'd put a decrypted save file into the software, and you'd be able to do a whole mess of things within that save file. The most significant being replacing equipment within your equipment box with whatever contents the game had to offer. Thankfully, this allowed the ability to place weapons in there that officially never saw the light of day. I was in awe seeing there were not only one, but two forbidden weapons for each weapon type. Lucky me. After saving the equipment to my file and then re-encrypting it, I was eager to test these weapons out. But there was a bit of a problem. That also leads to why they're referred to as forbidden. Something I forgot to specifically mention in the Forbidden Weapons video for Monster Hunter Try is that not only were they hidden from the average hunter, you literally weren't allowed to use these weapons in the online lobby. If you had them equipped, you'd be banned instantly by Capcom's auto detection system. And the Forbidden Weapons in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate work in a similar way. These developers did not want you to possess this ancient and awesome power. You could not accept or join Gathering Hall quests with them equipped. Elder Hall quests, event quests, guild quests, episodic bonus quests, urgent quests, even Village quests were barred from entry when you're equipped with the power of the forbidden weapons. And it's not because the weapons aren't official because they're in the game's code. If you attempt to start a quest with other weapons hidden in the game, like the dummy weapons, you can do them without a problem. The developers at Capcom deliberately made sure you were not able to use the weapons in most cases. So what can you do with them? What's the point of having such powerful weapons if you can't even hunt with them? Well, there's one way to wield them that's actually really useful, and that's the low, high, and G rank expeditions. Expeditions were a unique system in 4 and 4 Ultimate where you could go into a randomized map to explore, where monsters could spawn and when slain would give you many different rewards ranging from caravan points to special guild quests that allow you to obtain the well sought after relic weapons. You could mine, gather, explore, and most importantly, hunt many different kinds of monsters. It's one of my favorite features of Monster Hunter 4 and it'll thankfully allow us to test the power and might of these forbidden weapons. Something to note is that unlike the forbidden weapons in Monster Hunter Tri, the weapons in this game don't have a unique recolor to them. Most of them share a weapon model with something that already exists within the game. 
which makes sense considering 4 Ultimate has an absurd amount of weapon models to work with in the first place. Every single forbidden weapon still has its own unique weapon name, stats, and description, however. But real quick, let me explain to you how I'm going to be showing off these weapons. Monster Hunter games either use true or bloated weapon numbers. 4 Ultimate uses bloated, essentially big extravagant numbers, and we're going to stick with them in this video. I could use a calculator to convert all of that into true raw, but I like my theatrics. Big number equal good. That being said, it's hard to understand what the big numbers mean if you don't contextualize them. I will be comparing these weapons to the best weapons in their respective weapon types, including the best relic weapons. That way I can show you guys how strong these weapons truly are compared to the best official weapons the game offers. Now I did say I was going to show them off from what I believe to be the weakest to strongest, but I want to start this list off with a bit of a bang. I want to show off a unique pair of swords. The Saint Luxseed and the Demon Valkyrie Sword and Shields are the first of the forbidden weapons we'll be looking at today. There's a very interesting duality between them. The Demon Valkyrie represents darkness. Their weapon model is based on the Sukar Ankh SNS made from Gormagala parts. I love the way it awakens when unsheathed. The description reads, A demonic blade born from a nefarious scrawl. Its owner loses all they had loved. And the Saint Luxseed represents light. Their weapon model is based on Le Lumière, which is made from Shaguru Magala parts. The stained glass-like design on the shield is mesmerizing. The weapon description reads, A heroic sword talked about in legends. When held by the Chosen One, colors dance in the sky. They share the same weapon attack at 588, and they both have two slots, but what's more interesting is their differences. The story between these two blades tell the story of two Chosen, one of light and one of darkness, which plays with the duality within the story of Monster Hunter 4 regarding the Megalas. This duality is reflected in both the visual design and stats of the weapon. The weapon elements represent darkness and light with dragon and thunder, the demon Valkyrie is cursed with minus 10% affinity, where the Saint Luxseed is blessed with plus 10% affinity, and the demon Valkyrie has innate purple sharpness, whereas the Luxseed does not. This is a cool little story the developers snuck in, and it's extra neat to see it be told by two different forbidden weapons. Getting more in-depth with the stats here, the Saint Luxseed with sharpness plus one can be bumped up to purple. Purple sharpness is great to have in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, but it's not as overpowered as it is in games like Monster Hunter Tri and Freedom Unite. The 320 Thunder is good, beating out the amount you can get from the Cursed Rajang Club, which is the best forgeable Thunder Sword and Shield. Something like the Kirin Bolt Maximus would have much more Thunder, though, in place of Raw. When it comes to relic weapons, you can find better elements as well. 370 Thunder and 476 Raw with minus 10% affinity and purple sharpness is pretty good, but the Saint Lux Seat is still much more powerful thanks to the extra Raw. Overall, a great Thunder based sword and shield. There's a lot of RNG when it comes to getting the best relic weapons, but for the sake of comparing the forbidden weapons to the best weapons the game has to offer, I'll be using the stats of the best possible relic weapons throughout this video. The Demon Valkyrie ends up being a much stronger sword and shield compared to the Saint Luxseed, despite the minus 10% affinity. The natural purple sharpness that can be elevated by sharpness plus one or razor sharp on top of the 520 dragon element is no joke. It has 80 more dragon element than the best forgeable dragon sword and shield, the White Fatalis Sword, and almost 200 more raw damage, which is crazy. The best relic mentioned earlier would have 476 raw with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 370 element, so the Demon Valkyrie beats out both the best relic and forgeable weapon by a long shot as the uncontested strongest dragon sword and shield in the game. If anything is weak to that element, they'll be toast in no time. The devs gave us a treat with the duality here between these swords. There's so many more interesting things to talk about when it comes to the forbidden weapons, so let's check out the next one and begin our adventure through the list. Next up is the Insect Glaive, Hades Shine Rod. The weapon model is based off of another Shaguru Magala weapon, Le Miracle. The description reads, A beautiful pale white staff that reflects light when waved around, signals the arrival of Hades. It really does shimmer in the light. It's quite a pretty thing to witness. The weapon boasts 899 attack, 1080 thunder element, 3 slots, and comes with natural purple sharpness. Sharpness plus 1 isn't necessary, but will give it extra purple. The best thunder weapon you can forge is the Emperor Bolt Brute, and the Hades Shine Rod has it beat both in attack and basically having double the thunder element. On top of that, it has purple sharpness, which the Emperor Bolt does not. Same with what's considered one of the best forgeable insect glaives, the Bounding Delamador. In regards to relic weapons, the best relic has 1054 attack with minus 10% affinity, raw 
purple sharpness, but only 370 element. In situations where thunder element excels, the Hades Shine Rod can outshine relic weapons, and in general is stronger than any forgeable ones. Now you're probably wondering why a weapon this good that's also an insect glaive, the most overpowered weapon in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, is so low on this list. And that has to do with how kinsects work in this game. Basically, the kinsect cannot be upgraded separately in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. They're tied to the weapon itself. While the game actually gives you the option to upgrade the Forbidden Insect Glaives, it's actually impossible. It doesn't let you give it enough nectar to get to the insane thresholds needed to upgrade. Basically, this means you're permanently stuck with the level 1 Kinsect and unable to upgrade it to anything worthwhile, like the Bilbo Bricks that is really broken in this game, giving you a huge extension to your buff timers. If you didn't know, the level 1 Kinsect is horrible. The speed in which it tries to get you buffs and return to you is nothing short of comical. It just makes fights with the Insect Glaives so abysmal, it's just not worth the effort. On the topic of upgrades, aside from the Insect Glaives fake upgrades and the ability to add things like power and long barrels to bowguns, the Forbidden Weapon weapons cannot be upgraded or honed. Honing is a mechanic that can only be applied to forgeable weapons, so it excludes relics. It gives you the option to add extra defense, lifesteal, or attack to your rank 8 to 10 final upgrade weapons. When I'm bringing up the stats of a forgeable weapon in this video, I'll be referring to what their damage number is when honed, since it's the strongest it'll ever be. The Kinsect situation is quite unfortunate when we look at what could have been the best weapon in the entire game, the Insect Glaive Dancing Mad. Dancing Mad uses the Universus weapon model, which is made from Silver Rathalos. The weapon name is a reference to the final battle theme of Final Fantasy VI, a near 20 minute symphonic masterpiece featuring four movements during an incredible boss fight with a god. A glimpse of this power during this battle can be yours with this weapon. I'm very happy to see the devs reference one of the best Final Fantasy games ever made. The description of Dancing Mad reads, A glaive used to perform miracles in a faraway land. Offer it to the Wyvern Sedel. Reap the benefits. I wonder who this Wyvern Sedel is though. Doesn't ring a bell for me, but what do you guys think? Dancing Mad features 1302 weapon attack, 240 paralysis, white sharpness that can be bumped up to purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and a lovely 25% affinity. The best paralysis insect glaive, the Io Rovalier, only has 930 attack, white sharpness, and 150 paralysis. Again, the Bounding Dalam Durer only has 992 raw, 320 blast, and a max of white sharpness. Lastly, the best relic is 1054 attack with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 220 paralysis. Just a pure amount of raw damage with the added affinity this weapon has makes it worthy of the name Dancing Mad. It is incredibly powerful, coupled with the insanely high motion values for insect glaives in this game, you'd be dancing in the air and on land with this weapon joyfully, if it weren't for the level 1 Kinsect weighing you down. Still a really cool weapon hidden within the game's code for many reasons, and I'm happy I had the opportunity to show it to you guys. Next up is the Gun Lance, the Gaping Abyss. The weapon model is based off of Mawa Gah, which is made from Chaotic Gore Magala. The description reads, A gun lance embedded with a jewel said to prevent all calamity. Its fire heralds the coming of evil. And it's quite the beautiful jewel at that. I really can't stop staring at it. So sparkling. The Gaping Abyss has 759 attack, purple sharpness, sharpness plus one actually doesn't affect the sharpness at all with this weapon, 1050 dragon element, and it is a normal type gun lance with shot level one. The best forgeable, the true Fatalis gun lance, boasts 667 raw, 620 dragon, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and has normal with shot level five. The best relic has 782 attack, 500 dragon, purple sharpness, and also normal shot level five. The Gaping Abyss has some really good elemental damage, which isn't exactly useless when it comes to gun lances, but definitely could be more useful on another weapon. If a stab and shell type of playstyle is your go-to, this could be great against monsters weak to dragon. The biggest issue though with the Gaping Abyss and why it's so low on the list is the fact that the shot level is stuck on level one. That's typically the shot level you'd see on beginner low rank weapons, so it's a shame. Not saying you wouldn't find uses for this weapon, but it could definitely be stronger. Our next weapon is another gun lance, the Era Blazer. The Era Blazer is based off of the Hell Ruin gun lance made from Super Crimson Fatalis, and boy does it look pretty. The description reads, A manifestation of the anger of the planet. It scorches the sky, raises the earth, and leaves nothing behind. Yeah, sounds about right. You'd think it would have fire element, but the planet scorching comes from the blast of the gun lance, it seems. The weapon boasts 966 attack, 200 paralysis, natural purple sharpness that could be boosted with sharpness plus one, 30% affinity, and an extra 15 defense. The Era Blazer is also a normal type gun lance with shot level one. 
The best forgeable gun lance with similar specs would be the Veleno Fragola, with 644 attack, 250 paralysis, a bit of purple sharpness with sharpness plus 1, and normal shot level 4. The best relic would have 782 attack with minus 10% affinity, 300 paralysis, and purple sharpness. Gun lances like having high raw, and the Era Blazer provides that, but it falls short to the same issues as the Gaping Abyss. Having such a low shot level really limits the potential of a weapon like this, but boy, does it look cool. The next forbidden weapon to go over is an odd looking one, the Hunting Horn Endless Loop. The Endless Loop weapon model is based on the Eternal Music Box, which is made from various parts, predominantly Stygians and Ogre. The description reads, A hunting horn that lowers over all living things. The plate contains the secret truth of the cosmos. The plate does look like it knows a lot. So mesmerizing. I love the way the weapon glows and the way it spins when used, and it has such a pleasant tune to it as well. Take a listen. Endless Loop has 1716 weapon attack, 1080 dragon element, 30% affinity, and 50 defense. The song list includes Snow, Mud Negated, Abnormal Status Attack Boost, Abnormal Status Negated, and Divine Protection. The Endless Loop is much stronger than the best forgeable hunting horn for dragon, the Fatalis Menace Loot with 1508 attack, purple with sharpness plus 1, and 520 dragon. Compared to the best relic, the relic weapon has 1768 raw with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 750 element. The Endless would be great against any monster weak to dragon, but elemental damage isn't hunting horn's strong suit. Bonk them on the head with some high raw is the usual go-to. Still, the stats are nothing to scoff at, but the biggest issue with the Endless Loop is the dog water selection of buffs with the songs. Not having access to something like attack up L or negate stamina to buff yourself and your party definitely sucks. Still a good hunting horn nevertheless, but there's some better forbidden weapons out there. Next up is the Hammer, Apocalypse's Herald. The Apocalypse's Herald weapon model is based on the Hammer La Terre, made from Shagaru Magala parts. The description reads, It's said that this omen of ill will shall return everything to nothingness upon its arrival. Nothingness, eh? Probably from all those flames. This messenger for the apocalypse mixes some truly nutty stats. Love the look of that red stone in the center. 1820 attack. Purple sharpness with sharpness plus one. Two slots and a thousand and sixty fire element. Compared to the best forgeable hammer in the game, Fatalis Iron Guard, the Apocalypse's Herald beats it out in raw damage and smokes it in fire element. The best relic has 1872 attack with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 500 fire. The Herald is overall a really strong hammer, even if you weren't using it for the fire element. However, you could just spin to win and make use of that fire if you wanted to. Just like the Hunting Horn though, a weapon like Hammer favors more raw than element, which might be something we'll see with the other hammer later in this video. One of the funnest parts for me while uncovering these forbidden weapons is adventuring through the expeditions. I've been having so much fun hunting and exploring, but by far my favorite part is all these animations for unlocking new Pugi outfits by saving him. How could you walk away from him without helping the poor guy? But yeah, I think over the course of this whole video I've unlocked like 20 Pugi outfits. Next up is the Greatsword, Wrath of Stars. The Wrath of Stars uses the weapon model of the Wrath Flame Glyn Sword, made from Azure Rathalos. The weapon description reads, In times of need, hunters pray to this sword in the hope it may deliver them from evil. If anything, this weapon will at least deliver a crap ton of fire damage and natural purple sharpness. The Wrath of Stars has 1632 raw, natural purple sharpness that gets boosted with sharpness plus one, three slots, and 1050 fire element. The best forgeable greatsword is the Flame Fatalis Blade with 1296 raw with 20% affinity, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and a thousand fire. The best relic would go up to 1728 attack with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 750 fire. In general, the Wrath of Stars is very similar to what we saw with the Apocalypse's Herald, a weapon that usually only cares about high raw damage that has a bunch of element that could be super useful in niche situations. Overall, it's still a really strong weapon with some very solid stats. Our next forbidden weapon is the bow, the Moonlit Phoenix. The Moonlit Phoenix uses the weapon model of the Artemis Moonmaker, which is made from Golden Rathian. Interesting that they are keeping the moon motif here. The description reads, A heavenly bow belonging to a revered moon goddess. It dances in the sky with limitless grace. This very pretty looking bow boasts some interesting stats. A whopping 504 attack, 3 slots, and 400 thunder, but only if you have the skill awakening equipped, which is why the number is green there. The Moonlit Phoenix also has a power shot, meaning you can press a button to do an instant second shot after your initial charge. The weapon offers a blast coating boost, which isn't the greatest. You want to look for a close range coating boost in bows so they can do as much damage as power coatings. Speaking of coatings, you can use a good amount of them here, and the bow overall has a focus on doing pierce damage with its charge attacks. 
When it comes to the best forgeable thunder bow, that would be the Splatica, which kind of sounds like a Splatoon weapon. It features 324 weapon attack and 300 thunder, and focuses on rapid type charge attacks. It also doesn't need awaken to use thunder. The best pierce bow relic has 408 attack with minus 10% affinity and 370 thunder. 400 if it's a bow that needs to be awakened. The Moonlit Phoenix having about 100 more attack makes it the best possible thunder element pierce bow. The issue is that pierce bows aren't the greatest in this game, but like a lot of previous forbidden weapons we've gone over, it has its niche uses that would make it really powerful. Next up is a lance weapon named Purification. The Purification shares its weapon model with Lucifer Sage, which is made from Chaotic Gormagala. The description reads, an odd lance granted to a saintly warrior who made a pact with a demon to exterminate his brethren. This weapon description is extremely interesting to me because in the previous Forbidden Weapons video, there was also some deep lore about saintly warriors either protecting mankind or losing to gods, so I wonder if it's all related. Does this tale have anything to do with the Elder Babel Spear or the Nega Babylon? Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself though. Visually, this lance looks incredible. The sheen of the Shaguru elements, the design of the shield, and the lance itself is nothing short of striking. My favorite part of it, though, is how the cloth moves like Gormagala's wings during certain animations. Probably because it's made from Gormagala's wings. Let's take a look at the stats. We have 736 weapon attack, purple sharpness when boosted with sharpness plus one, an extra 20 defense. The insane amounts of water element definitely represent the words purification here. Let's compare it to the best forgeable water lances. The Caduceus has 690 attack with 10% affinity, 340 water, and purple with sharpness plus 1. The Shark Assault has 504 attack, 800 water, and also a little bit of purple with sharpness plus 1. The Best Relic has 782 attack with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 500 water. Purification is just the best water lance without a doubt. Elemental damage suits lances so well, so this weapon is very strong overall. It takes as long with you to fight a monster weak to water, and you'll be able to splash him to death quite quickly. The weapons are starting to get pretty good. We still have plenty to go through, and trust me, they get insane. Our next weapon is yet another lance, the Hell Phalanx. The Hell Phalanx shares this weapon model with the Herbal Lance Plus, which comes from Seregios. I mentioned earlier that Seregios weapons have unique passive effects in this game. The Herbal Lance would sharpen itself after a certain amount of hops with your weapon unsheathed. This effect would double if you had the skill Razor Sharp equipped. Despite the Hell Phalanx having a Seregios model weapon though, it unfortunately doesn't keep the same passive and acts like a normal weapon. Well, a normal forbidden weapon at least. The description for the Hell Phalanx reads, A hunter once uses lance to bring calamity to the land. It lashes out with a thousand blades. Another lance that brings calamity to the land. I, I wonder why this type of story is so prevalent when it comes to lances. The thousand blades, of course, references the fact that it's a Seregios weapon and the fact that when you unsheathe it, all of these fine blades present themselves. Regarding stats, the Hell Phalanx has 966 attack with 40% affinity, Natural purple sharpness, sharpness plus one does not affect this weapon. It also has three slots and 300 blast if you have the Awaken skill equipped. The best forgeable blast lance, the Lightbreak lance, has 690 attack, 400 blast, and purple sharpness with sharpness plus one. Another really good blast lance, the True Runer lance, has 598 attack with 30% affinity, 620 blast, and a good amount of purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, along with three slots. Not bad, but their raw damage isn't even close to what Hell Phalanx has. Let's quickly check out the stats of the best relic weapon. They can have 782 attack with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 300 blast. Even if you don't awaken the blast element on the Hell Phalanx, the insane amount of raw damage is going to wreak serious havoc to any monster you face. Counter, guard, and evade your way into getting that juicy crit off 40% of the time. Definitely a great forbidden weapon to use in most situations. Our next weapon is the Charge Blade, the Fallen Margenrote. The Fallen Margenrote shares its weapon model with the Elens Esor, yet another forbidden weapon that uses a model from Chaotic or Magala. The weapon description reads, A powerful blade that harnesses both light and dark. The eye of the angel Aurora is lodged within. The light and dark, of course, referencing the Chaotic Gormagala weapon model having both light and dark infused to it. And Aurora is a name of Latin origin, meaning dawn. Them saying Aurora's eye is lodged within the skull face of the charge blade is kind of sinister and brutal, though. Also kind of cool. The Fallen Morgenrute has 1188 attack. It has natural purple sharpness. Sharpness plus one does not affect it. An impact file, which is the best file to have on charge blades, and 1040 water element. One of the best forgeable charge blades happens to be water element as well, the C. Deus Regalia. It has 1152 attack and 410 water with a bit of purple sharpness with sharpness plus one. The best relic has 1224 attack with minus 10% affinity and only 500 water. Charge Blade is another one of those weapons where having high raw is much more important than element, but even without the whopping 1040 water, it's still a really damn good Charge Blade. 
And considering how strong they are in this game with impact files, you're going to be doing some serious damage with the fallen Morgenruta, especially on anything susceptible to water. We're entering the top 15 now. Things are getting heated. The next forbidden weapon is the light bow gun, the Scatterfly Rack. The Scatterfly Rack uses the model of the Heavy Grizzfire, which is made from Molten Tigrex. The description reads, Hits targets like a herd of wild beasts. Those who are shot don't live to see tomorrow. I genuinely believe this, considering this weapon is a miniature tank. A goddamn miniature tank, holy crap, this is badass. The base Scatterfly Rack has 559 raw with 10% affinity, 3 slots, average reload speed, no deviation, and high recoil. The right armor skills and the long barrel equipped, the stats become 595 attack, very fast reload speed, and low recoil. The rack has a good variety of ammunition, and you have access to a lot of normal 2, 3, and pierce 3 per clip. The rack also allows rapid fire of pierce shot level 2, crag shot level 1, and crag shot level 2. They have average and high wait times, which is pretty bad. Wait for rapid fire, unlike recoil, can't be mitigated by armor skills, so what you get is what you get, and generally you want it to be a low wait time, or you'll be out there like a deer in headlights after firing. The best light bow gun is considered the Vayu Sedition, which has up to 452 attack when honed and equipped with a long barrel, even more attack if you remove the limiter and it has 20% affinity. If you choose to remove the limiter, basically you can't rapid fire anymore, and instead you can use every clip on your light bow gun with a single reload, which is what I recommend to use for the Scatterfly Rack. The Vayu Sedition has a much smaller clip for normal and pierce, but it does have the Serigios passive. For this weapon, every evade will bring a bullet back into your clip, which is kind of amazing. The best relic weapon can have 472 attack with minus 10% affinity, equipped with a long barrel, and you can luck out with getting low reload and recoil and your preferred rapid fire patterns. Despite how good those weapons can be and the weaknesses of the Scatterfly Rack, if you remove the limiter, that over 600 attack damage with 10% affinity is going to do a lot of damage. There aren't too many reasons to use this instead of a beefed up heavy bowgun though, but once again, there's always an issues for a weapon like this. Overall, for many reasons, mainly the fact that it looks like a tank, it has a nice spot on this list of forbidden weapons. Next weapon on the chopping block is another bow, the Daybreak Arrow. The Daybreak Arrow's weapon model is based on the Heatful Elizabeth, which is made from Sideus parts exchanged for at the Wyporium. The description reads, The one and only bow used by the goddess Trilo on the battlefield signals the end of days when drawn. Yet another bow description based on some sort of goddess lore. They must have named the goddess Trilo because this weapon is based off of Cideus, which was introduced in Monster Hunter Tri. As a big fan of Tri myself, this makes me quite happy. The Daybreak Arrow features 408 attack with 40% affinity and 1050 dragon element. Instead of power shot, it has arc shot focus, which rains arrows from the sky, which for this kind of bow is actually a good thing. Daybreak has a close range coating boost, which is awesome. It has pierce level 5 on its second charge shot and rapid level 5 on its third, which is also good. The best forgeable dragon bow is Victory and Glory, which has 360 attack, 380 dragon, rapid 5 on charge 4 with power shot. The best bow in general is considered the Kama Sedition, which has 408 attack with 30% affinity, rapid 5 on charge level 2, and also has power shot. The Daybreak arrow gives you a lot of options. Power shot would have been nice to have if you were using it mostly for its rapid charges. If you're facing an enemy that's weak to dragon, you can erase them from existence, my friend. Pierce in general is considered the weakest shot type, but with high raw and dragon element almost three times as much as the competition, coupled with the elemental damage of an arc shot, means you can seriously cook with the Daybreak. A very solid bow. Next up, we have a longsword, the Crimson Dancer. The Crimson Dancer uses the weapon model of the Susano Blade, which is made from miscellaneous parts. The weapon aesthetics are simple, yet clean. The description reads, A legendary sword decorated with beautiful flower patterns. Its beauty hides the face of evil. Uh, wait, what do they mean, face of evil? Is the evil face the sword itself, or the person wielding the sword? Okay, this actually has me stumped. The weapon boasts 1089 attack, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and 1020 ice element. The best forgeable ice longsword is the Deora Storm. It has 957 attack, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and 530 ice element. The best relic has 1122 raw with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 540 element. This is the uncontested best ice longsword by a wide margin. Double the ice element is no joke. Like the other faster weapons like Lance and Sword and Shield, having a balance of raw and element is the way to go for the longsword. Having almost as much element as raw though is insane. Going up against any monsters weak to ice element will spell disaster for them. Our next forbidden weapon is the Rebel Paradigm. The Rebel Paradigm model is based off of the Teufelschleider, made from Gormagala. I hope I said that right. The weapon description reads, A weapon used to usurp a tyrannical government. Was there really no other way? 
This description in particular is so funny to me. Saying there really is no other way? Uh, of course not. The only way to take down a tyrannical government is to use a light bow gun that looks like one of those epic skeleton t-shirts. Using a skeleton attached to a spinal cord and ribcage that's a gun is the only way to successfully lead a revolution. The Rebel Paradigm without any upgrades has 546 attack with 45% affinity, two slots, average reload speed, no deviation, and high recoil. It has a decent variety of ammunition. It has a lot of room for a normal three in its clip, but the rest aren't that crazy. You can rapid fire normal shot level two, flaming shot, and water shot. Normal and water have low wait times, so they are going to be the ones you'd use for this particular weapon. After adding a long barrel and equipping armor skills, the Rebel Paradigm gets 582 attack, very fast reload, and low recoil. The best forgeable water light bow gun is the Battalion Strafer, which has 439 attack when owned with a long barrel, similar ammo loadout, and an extra 45 defense. The best relic has 472 attack with minus 10% affinity when equipped with a long barrel, and you can once again luck out with the low reload and recoil and rapid fire patterns. The Rebel Paradigm has a really high amount of raw coupled with 45% affinity. You could use it for its normal shot to rapid fire, but I think it excels the most when it comes to the water shot. Who wouldn't want to make a skeleton spit on a monster till it dies? Our next weapon is a dual blade dubbed the Crooked Blades. Crooked Blades use the same model as the Fledder Klon, which are made from Gormagala. If you didn't know by now, the Gormagala weapons names are in German, the Shaguru Magala weapons are in French, and Kiata Gormagala uses both languages. I, I'm not, I promise I'm not crazy. These dual blades are one of the only ones in the game that are actually held in this special backwards claw grip, and it looks sick. The description reads, It's said that inside dwells a princess who sold her soul to a demon to quell her arrogance. Perhaps the soul of the princess lives within the eyes of these crooked blades. The weapon has 588 weapon attack with 60% affinity, purple sharpness that can be boosted with sharpness plus one, two slots, and 250 sleep. The best forgeable sleep dual blades are the Eternal Leave Takers that has 462 attack with minus 10% affinity, and a bit of natural purple sharpness with 100 sleep element. The best relic weapons can have 476 attack and 220 sleep. Sleep dual blades is definitely not a commonly used strategy Usually something like Paralysis or Blast is better used for status weapons. You're not really supposed to focus on sleep with dual blades. Its strength, though, lies in that juicy, juicy raw damage. The raw attack is actually so much higher than the competition, and that's before you factor the 60% crit rate. They're gonna start calling this the crit blades for real. We are now in the top 10 of the forbidden weapons. Our next forbidden weapon is yet another dual blade, the Cross Inferno. The Cross Inferno uses the weapon model of the Twin Bane Twilight, which is made from Fatalis. The description reads, Dual blades that possess the power of the flames of the universe. They leave no remains in their wake. This weapon description truly is not an exaggeration. The Cross Inferno has 420 weed attack, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and a whopping 1200 fire element. 1200! This thing's a damn flamethrower. The comparisons here are gonna be outrageous. The best forgeable fire dual blades, the Wyvern Conciliation, has 434 attack, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and only 300 fire. The best possible relic has 476 attack, purple sharpness, and 370 fire. Dual blades being an extremely quick weapon excels with high elements, so having three times as much fire as the best relic weapon means this weapon can do some serious damage to anything even remotely weak to fire. I fear for any monster in the path of the Cross Inferno. Next up is Olvid of the Abyss. Olvid of the Abyss is the first of our weapons to be based on a Gogmazios weapon. This specific one being the Wicked Conqueror. Like every other Gogmazios weapon, they cooked with the designs. This switch axe looks so damn cool and has an equally interesting description. The tales say Emperor Olvid could separate body and soul with one swing of this weapon. There's something so sick about when these weapon descriptions and weapon names relate to each other. Like it's called Olvid of the Abyss because you're swinging Emperor Olvid himself. I don't know why I find that so cool. Since he can separate both body and soul, the stats gotta be pretty decent, right? Olvid Rock's 1782 weapon attack accompanied by 50% affinity, meaning you're critting half the time you attack. It also has natural purple sharpness that can be extended with sharpness plus one, 1110 dragon element, and boasts a power file. Switch axes either have power file, element file, or dragon file. Typically you want power file because it gives your sword mode an extra 20% attack per swing. Element file gives you 25% more elemental damage during sword mode and dragon file awakens unawakened dragon element, poison, or paralysis in sword mode. The best forgeable dragon switch axe is the Stygian Vanagloria with 1620 weapon attack with purple sharpness after sharpness plus one, 350 dragon, and of course power file. 
The best forgeable switch axe in general is the Seadeed axe, which has 1674 attack with 15% affinity and a power file, 20 defense, and a bit of purple sharpness with sharpness plus one. Now comparing to the best relic, it would have 1836 attack with minus 10% affinity and 500 dragon element with a power file. With that juicy 50% affinity, the raw power of Olvid is nothing to scoff at. The insane amount of dragon element would be better used with an elemental file, but you could honestly just run Olvid as an all-use switch axe and tear through any souls in your path powerful stats for an even more powerful looking switch axe. The next forbidden weapon is a hunting horn, the scorpion loot. The scorpion loot weapon model is based on the bloodied Dalamador, which is made from the monster Shah Dalamador. The sounds this horn produces are so wonderful. The description of the scorpion loot reads, a hunting horn said to make even the stars sing. Its owner is granted divine protection. This is really funny because his hunting horn literally does not provide divine protection. That was the Endless Loop. The Endless Loop had divine protection in its songs list. It does, however, provide attack up L, health boost L, wind pressure negated, and defense boost L, which is a really damn good list of buffs at your disposal. The Scorpion Loot has 2,184 attack, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, two slots, and 290 paralysis. Let's put into perspective how insane 2184 attack is. The Makarn Sedition, which is considered the best forgeable hunting horn, has 1560 raw with 20% affinity, it has purple sharpness without sharpness plus one, and it has the Cerigio's passive of sharpening after evading. A great hunting horn, don't get me wrong, but Scorpion Loot has nearly 700 more raw damage. The best relic has 1768 attack with minus 10% affinity, with 450 paralysis, and the song list of your choosing, so you get lucky. Still shy of about 400 attack. The Scorpion Loot has insane amounts of rod damage, an ability to buff yourself and your party with attack up L, and the occasional paralysis proc on monsters in between hitting your stuns. It is a goddamn hunting horn machine, and the music. The cherry on top, I'd say. Definitely worthy of its place in the top 10. Next up is a heavy bowgun, the Giant Pan. It's probably pronounced Giant Pawn. This weapon model is based on the Arzuros Yokozuna, which is made from the big Arzuros bear himself. The weapon description reads, A giant weapon said to have ignited the core of the world. Its handlers must proceed with extreme care. It's true, you must handle this weapon with the utmost care. It is a giant pan after all, and you don't want to drop its delicious contents. The pan boasts 675 attack with minus 30% affinity, with average reload and recoil and no deviation. It also gives us plus 45 defense as a little treat. With the power barrel upgrade and armor skills, the attack goes up to 742, and the reload becomes very fast and the recoil becomes very low. The pan can't use pierce or pellet, but it has great room for normal shots, which makes sense considering it allows you to crouching fire both normal shot 2 and 3. Oh, and also flaming shots if you're into that. Crouching fire refers to the siege mode you can do specifically with heavy bowguns, which basically allows you to stay in place and unload an ungodly amount of bullets without having to reload, assuming you don't get hit of course. You can remove this feature in exchange for more raw damage by getting rid of the limiter, similar to the light bowgun. Let's compare the pan to the best normal siege heavy bowgun, the Livid Grizz Cannon. It has 562 attack when owned and paired with a power barrel along with 15% affinity. It allows crouching fire for normal shot level 2, amongst other things. The best relic can have all the features of the giant pan, but the weapon attack is capped at 540 with minus 10% affinity. So overall, despite the minus 30% affinity, the incredibly high raw damage makes this the goat of normal siege heavy bowguns. If you can pin down the monster you're facing, don't underestimate the power of a heavy bowgun, especially this one. This weapon can reduce your hunt times from minutes to seconds. Big day for pan lovers. Our next forbidden weapon is a longsword, dubbed the Nirvana Blade. The Nirvana Blade shares this weapon model with the Stalor Tail, which is made from Gormagala. What a sleek weapon this is. The weapon description reads, A blade named after the land of death. It holds inside knowledge beyond human comprehension. Nirvana is a concept that represents many things, such as the cycle of birth and rebirth, but I fear whatever you hunt with this weapon isn't coming back. This is an incredibly powerful forbidden weapon. Let's take a look at its stats. The Nirvana Blade has 1386 attack with 55% affinity, Natural purple sharpness, sharpness plus one won't boost it, so stick with razor sharp. With the awakened skill, you can nab 330 dragon element, and the Nirvana blade is kind enough to give you an extra 20 defense. Must be the knowledge beyond human comprehension buff. A similar forgeable weapon is the Doom Blade Slave, which has 990 attack with 10% affinity, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and 280 dragon when awakened along with one slot. The best possible relic weapon would have 1122 attack with minus 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 540 dragon. Despite it not having the most dragon element ever, you could definitely awaken and use it if you're up against anything weak to it, but even without it, having 1386 attack with 55% affinity 
with natural purple sharpness, this weapon is a beast. You will simply be slicing and critting your way until your next meditation session with the Nirvana Blade. We are finally at the top five strongest forbidden weapons. It's time to show off the most broken weapons Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate has to offer. The Shaw Bloodseeker. Its model is based on the Praying Dalamador, unsurprisingly made from Shaw Dalamador, and what a stunning design this is. Its weapon description reads, A cursed switch axe, bathed in blood. Sinners can never repent for their travesties. Damn, that's brutal. What could be mistaken as an unused upgrade to the Praying Dalamador switch axe is one of the best weapons in this wonderful game. These sinners won't stand a chance. The Shaw Bloodseeker has 2,268 attack with a power file, natural purple sharpness, sharpness plus one has no effect, 700 poison status, three slots, and a cute 15 defense boost. Let's compare it to the best forgeable poison switch axe, the Wax Glare Wand. The wand has 1566 attack along with a power file, purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and 300 poison. The best relic would have 1836 attack, minus 10% affinity, and 300 poison as well. The Shaw Bloodseeker really makes any other switch axe look like a baby weapon. An additional 20% damage in sword mode with 2268 attack, natural purple, and on top of that you can rack up constant poison status with more than double what's available in other switch axes? The stats on this thing are just ridiculous. You can easily slice and poison your way through any monster in your path. The next forbidden weapon is another heavy bowgun. The giant pan was so good, what could possibly top that? This is the Romea Crossbow. Its design is based on the Trembling Lordship, which is created from Gogmazio's parts. The glow of this weapon and the reload animation goes crazy. Once again, peak weapon design from Gogmazio. The weapon description reads, A heavy bowgun belonging to one of history's greatest tricksters, who was damned to a life of loneliness. I'm fascinated by who this Romea character is and why they are so alone. Uh, perhaps it was difficult to be within the presence of such a godly weapon, because this is hands down one of the best heavy bow guns of all time. Or should I say crossbow? The Romea crossbow has 630 attack along with 30% affinity. It has average reload speed, no deviation, and average recoil. With a power barrel equipped and some armor skills, it goes up to 693 attack with very fast reload speed and very low recoil. The Romea boasts a healthy clip size for pierce and pellet and a whopping 10 bullets for normal three. The most important thing about this weapon is that it can siege fire both pierce shot level two and pierce shot level three. The best forgeable heavy bowgun in the game is considered the Gravios Giga Cannon which is also used predominantly for its Pierce 2 and 3 siege abilities. The Giga Cannon, without armor skills, has severe deviation and slow reload. When honed and equipped with a power barrel, it has 576 attack and an extra 40 defense. Best Relic can have 540 attack with minus 10% affinity. So comparing the Romeo Crossbow to its biggest competition, the Giga Cannon, it has 55 more attack along with the lovely 30% affinity. Now, this might not seem like a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, but it's actually a massive damage boost considering just how strong pierce damage is in this game when it comes to heavy bow guns. An upgrade like this means a huge increase in DPS when in siege mode. Simply shoot any monster in your way and they will be eviscerated by the Romeo crossbow. Our next forbidden weapon is a hammer named HOS. The HOS uses the same weapon model as the Pride of Hearth. What's really interesting about that is the Pride of Hearth is awarded for defeating White Fatalis during one of the episodic quests. A great reward for an incredible fight. It's funny that this is much stronger though. It's like, yeah, good job killing this god creature. We're gonna hide a much better hammer somewhere else. Good luck finding it. So what does HOS stand for anyway? Well, that's answered in the weapon description that reads, Short for Hammer of Stinga, the oldest known surviving work of Hearth's blacksmiths. It seems that not only is this hammer visually connected to the Pride of Hearth, it's also connected to Hearth within its lore as well. Was this supposed to be an upgrade that they scrapped? Or is there more meaning behind the existence of the HOS? I'm gonna need you guys to brace yourselves before I read out the stats here. Ready? Okay. The Hammer of Singa has 2,340 attack with natural purple sharpness. Sharpness plus one does not affect its sharpness. It also comes with three slots, and if you choose to use Awaken, you're granted 150 Dragon Element. Let's put this into perspective. Once again, the best forgeable hammer is the Fatalis Iron Guard, and it has 1716 attack and 260 fire, and it needs sharpness plus one to have purple. Otherwise, it's stuck with blue. For giggles, let's check out the stats on the Pride of Hearth. It has 1820 raw with 10% affinity, However, it has green sharpness and barely a sliver of blue with sharpness plus one. The best relic has 1872 raw with 10% affinity, purple sharpness, and 500 dragon. The most important thing when it comes to a hammer is without a doubt raw attack damage. 
Raw is king. And the Hammer of Stinga has 2,340 Raw with the Purple Sharpness multiplier right out of the box. You honestly don't even need to bother getting Awakening for the small amount of Dragon. You could spend those slots on other more useful damage increasing armor skills. Having around 500 more attack than its competition means the Hammer of Stinga can crush the skulls of any monster and would make a Grongagas user shed tears of joy if they ever have the opportunity to wield such a beautiful and devastating hammer created by Hearth's best. The next forbidden weapon I have the pleasure of introducing is a charge blade, and it's the legendary Awarisha. The Awarisha uses the weapon model of the True Ruiner Reaver, which is made from Fatalis. Which is really funny considering the True Ruiner Reaver is considered the best forgeable charge blade. Awarisha's weapon description reads, A charge blade born out of greed. The saintly warrior Pak fell victim to its nefarious devices. Pouring one out for Pak here. Pac is how you say Easter en Francais, which is where I'm assuming where they got the saintly name from. I can understand why they would refer to this charge blade as greedy when you see how it hogs all the good stats for itself here. 1512 attack with 30% affinity and an impact file. A bit of natural purple sharpness that can be increased significantly with sharpness plus one. 20 defense, 200 dragon element if awakened, and three big ol' slots. Let's compare it to the true rune or reaver I mentioned earlier. 1044 attack with 10% affinity, 400 blast and purple sharpness with sharpness plus one with three slots as well. The best relic would have 1224 attack with minus 10% affinity and 500 dragon. Similar to the HOS, we care about raw damage here and don't need to worry about awakening the dragon element. When it comes to raw damage, the Aurisha has plenty of it with 300 more attack than the best possible relic weapon. It's no secret that charge blades are overpowered in four ultimate. So to have a charge blade with this much attack added affinity, impact file, and natural purple sharpness is nothing short of disgusting. The Aurisha in the hands of a master would simply be a heavenly sight to behold, a godlike weapon enrobed in the skin of a god. And we finally made it, the final forbidden weapon, and what I consider to be the strongest weapon in the game, forbidden or not, the Dos Exile. The Dos Exile uses the weapon model of the Ostracon Oblivion, that's crafted from the Elder Dragon Gogmazias. The weapon has a lovely faint glow, and when fully charged, an extra pattern appears. The Dos Exile's weapon description is as follows. A legendary sword, once wielded by a fabled warrior, but its true form is... Probably one of the most interesting item descriptions out of all the forbidden weapons. Who is the legendary warrior who wielded this weapon? And what is this true form that it speaks of? Exile means the state of being barred from one's native country, so the weapon name suggests that perhaps the Fable Warrior was exiled from his native lands, which in Monster Hunter Dos would be Jumbo Village, and or reintroduced in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, Don Durma. Perhaps I'm being a little crazy, but I feel like there's too many coincidences here for this not to be deliberate. The Dos Exile features a whopping 2016 attack with an insane 60% affinity. It obtains purple sharpness for sharpness plus one, as well as two slots, 40 extra defense, and 400 thunder should you choose to awaken it. One of the best forgeable greatswords is the Black Fatalis Blade, which has 1584 attack when it honed, accompanied by purple sharpness with sharpness plus one, and 430 dragon damage. Forgeable greatswords pale in comparison to relics though, since raw damage is so crucial for them. The best possible greatsword relic weapon caps out at 1728 attack with minus 10% affinity and 750 element. So not only does the Dos Exile have 300 more attack, than the best possible relic weapon, it has 60% affinity on top of that. That's simply absurd amounts of damage from a greatsword, and the build potential for the specific weapon is quite frankly making me salivate. The Dos Exile to me has the most interesting lore, design, and the best stats. This greatsword will implode anything it touches, so maybe, just maybe, it was right for the developers to keep it forbidden. At the end of the day, we can't use these weapons anywhere other than expeditions. But the stories they tell and the stats they possess are nothing short of amazing. It's still really cool that we can hunt with them, at least we can fight loads of g rank monsters and expeditions, but there's just so many questions that are going through my head. Why go through the effort of giving such unique names and descriptions to these weapons, and why make them forbidden? Why is this not the first time they've done this in a Monster Hunter game, and have they done it again since? So many questions. Perhaps we'll answer them one day here on the Fly and Toot channel. I had a lot of fun uncovering the secrets of these forbidden weapons. If you enjoy the effort I put into these videos, please consider supporting the channel by subscribing. There's still so much more to talk about and discover when it comes to Monster Hunter. It's really a game series that keeps on giving, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to share some of its secrets with you guys today. Until next time. <laughs>